So I thought I'd start out with um, a patient that um, I came across during my um, <clears throat> quality review. And this is a patient that was on our neurohospitalist service admitted with uh, intracranial hemorrhage. The patient had actually been transferred to us from another facility. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you see a head CT with multiple areas of hyperdensity, which are um, intracranial hemorrhages. And as we all know, intracranial hemorrhage is associated with a significant morbidity and mortality. And the patient here who um, had this head CT had received IV thrombolytics before the CT scan was done. And my question is, could we have predicted this outcome in this patient? Was there a precursor to this ICH that could have been identified? And it turns out that this patient actually had had an MRI of the brain um, within the last year before she received IV thrombolytics. And these are her um, MRI pictures, which on my screen don't show up well, but on this screen do show up well. And does this work? I'm not sure the laser pointer is working. But these multiple areas of dark signal on this susceptibility weighted image are areas of microhemorrhage. And one of the reasons why I picked this topic today was from a stroke standpoint, we know that the um, incidence of anticoagulation associated intracranial hemorrhage has been increasing. And really, that's because we're using intracranial hemorrhage, or we're using anticoagulation, especially in patients with atrial fibrillation, more and more. Thank you. And here you can see between 1988 and 1999, there's a substantial increase in the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, especially in older patients. So my objectives today of my talk were to review cerebral microbleeds and talk about what are these, review cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and discuss the cl clinical relevance when we're trying to make decisions when we see these patients in clinic or in the hospital regarding their treatment plans if they have cerebral microbleeds or cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So what are cerebral microbleeds? They were first described in 1996. The term was really coined by Dr. Offenbacher, who um, termed this coined petechial or microhemorrhages. And these are seen on gradient echo images in patients who had presented with um, symptomatic, non-traumatic intracranial hemorrhage. And then within a few years, there were histopathological um, studies which showed what the um, pathology looked like on um, postmortem studies. And really, microbleeds are a radiological phenomena. So until the gradient echo became widely used, we really didn't know about these. We did know, of course, that cerebral amyloid angiopathy existed. But when gradient echo images and later susceptibility images um, were used in uh, radiology, then we um, realized that these are actually very prevalent, especially in the aging population. And there are black dots seen on these gradient echo and susceptibility weighted images. And they represent blood products, which I'll um, get to in a few more slides. They should be round or ovoid. And um, the size um, should be between 10 and 2 to 10 millimeters. An exact cutoff isn't really, um, hasn't really been decided upon. Most of them are about 5 millimeters. And they shouldn't be visible on head CT. These are not calcifications. So what happens, why you get a dark spot on the gradient echo images is that hemosiderin is actually um, deposited and it's picked up by macrophage, macrophages. So hemosiderin is a blood um, breakdown product. And the hemosiderin is actually very paramag paramagnetic. And so there's a fast decay of the MR signal leading to a signal dropout. And they appear as black or hypointense lesions on MR sequence, sequences that are sensitive to these susceptibility artifacts. And one of the things to remember is that 
Um, there are things that influence uh, cerebral microbleed detection. So the pulse sequence that's used on the MRI, the sequence parameters, the spatial res resolution, the magnetic field strength, and the post-imaging processing. So centers use different MRR sequences to detect microbleeds. So for example, at um, Issaquah, we use susceptibility-weighted images. At First Hill, we use susceptibility-weighted images on inpatients. And at Cherry Hill, historically, we've used gradient echo images. And the um, level of detection varies with how sensitive those studies are. And when you look at research studies or case series on patients who have cerebral microbleeds, the reported incidence of the microbleeds varies because it varies by what um, MR sequence was used. And another thing to remember is that a patient can have an MRI of the brain, and if they don't have MR sequences like gradient echo or susceptibility-weighted images, you could miss the fact that they have microbleeds because that sequence wasn't done. We don't see these on M and T2 or um, T1 sequences. So the most uh, sensitive uh, MR imaging test for microbleeds is actually susceptibility-weighted images, which is a post-processing technique which increases the contrast between brain and hemosiderin. And then T2 gradient echo is sort of in the middle, and T2-weighted spin echo is less sensitive. So here are some pictures of MRIs just showing you the difference in the sensitivity. So on the left here, in the upper left-hand corner, this is a gradient echo um, image. And there are a few microbleeds that are hard to see. But right next to the um, gradient echo sequence is the susceptibility-weighted image in the same patient. And you see these black dots are much more um, uh, easily identified on the susceptibility weighted images. And um, it, the uh, detection of the microbleeds also depends on the um, magnet strength. So in the lower right hand corner is a 1.5 Tesla MRI. In the lower right hand corner here is a 3 uh, Tesla MRI. And again, the microbleeds are much more easily detected. Similarly, if the patient has thick slices on the MRI versus thin slices, the microbleeds are easier um, detected on the thin slices. Oops. So there are proposed criteria for identifying cerebral microbleeds, and this was published in 2009 in Lancet Neurology. And microbleeds should have, they should be black lesions on T2 star-weighted images. They should be round or ovoid lesions rather than linear. Linear lesions um, would imply that the um, uh, dr signal dropout could be due to a uh, blood vessel. And there's something called blooming artifact on T2 star weighted images, which I'll show you on the next slide. They should be devoid of signal hyperintensity on T1 or T2 weighted images. And at, la at least half the lesion should be surrounded by brain parenchyma. And that's one of the things that helps you distinguish these from blood vessels as well. Additionally, they should be distinct from other mimics such as iron, calcium deposits, bone, or vessel flow voids. And the patient should not have a clinical history suggestive of um, traumatic diffuse axonal injury. So on this next slide, this is an example of blooming artifacts. So what blooming artifact is, and you've probably seen this before on um, neuroradiology reports, but it's actually areas of low signal intensity on T2 star where it's much larger than the actual hemosiderin deposit. So on the left is a T2 fast spin echo series where you, right here, if you look carefully, you see a microbleed. But on the gradient echo, that microbleed is much larger in diameter, and that's just because the, um, this is a blooming artifact that's seen on gradient echo. The other thing that, you, that is um, seen on this image is really if you look at this microbleed, more than 50% of it, um, well, actually about 50% of it is surrounded by 
um, brain parenchyma, which is one of the things that you want to make sure that you see. This is an example of what you don't want to call a microbleed. So on the left-hand side is a, what looks like a um, cerebral microbleed. It is a hypo-intense lesion on gradient echo. But on the right, there's actually calcification in that region on CT scan. So that would not be considered a microbleed. This patient did have actual, uh, an actual intracranial hemorrhage on the left. And then this is an example of a patient with a um, cavernoma. So on the left, you see this hypo-intensity on T2 images with a central portion that's hyper-intense. And same thing on the T1 images. It does look dark on the um, susceptibility-weighted images. So this could be misidentified as a microbleed. But given the bright signal on T1 and T2, this is actually a cavernoma. So what are microbleeds if you looked at them under the microscope? So there have been a few histopathological studies which have looked at um, uh, what's associated with these microbleeds. And here are, here's a meta-analysis of these studies that was published in 2011. The first study that came out was in 1999 by um, Dr. Fazekas, and basically, these studies show a similar pattern, which is that there are hemosiderin-laden macrophages, and the hemo hemosiderin within the macrophages is what gives you the um, dark signal on the um, gradient echo images. However, on these histopathological studies, there's also other um, markers of vascular disease, and namely, um, lipofibrohyalinosis, which is seen with high blood pressure and hypertensive vasculopathy, as well as associated amyloid angiopathy. So these slides are taken from the initial study um, published by Dr. Fazekas, and unfortunately they are black and white, but on figure two, um, this study was um, looking for amyloid deposits, and um, there was positive yellow-green bifurringins um, looking for amyloid angiopathy. In the middle um, uh, study or slide here, this is a, another MR-positive microbleed, and these areas are um, staining for hemosiderin, so these are hem hemosiderin-laden macrophages. And then on the right-hand side here is a um, dilation of perivascular spaces, and there are a few hemosiderin-laden macrophages as well. And this is a vessel with um, hypertensive angiopathy. So we do know that cerebral microbleeds are markers for hypertensive vasculopathy and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And from a stroke standpoint, location does matter. The hypertensive vasculopathy microbleeds tend to occur in the basal ganglia, the thalami, as well as the brainstem and the cerebellum, whereas cerebral amyloid angiopathy microbleeds tend to occur in the cortical, subcortical, and cerebellar regions. So there have been um, many case series and um, longitudinal studies looking for cerebral microbleeds. Who has these? So there are actually um, studies of the aging population, such as the Rotterdam study, where they followed patients and there, were, um, there was a subgroup analysis using MRI. And actually, up to 11 to 23 percent of the aging population can have cerebral microbleeds. Um, we also know that there's an association with lacunar ischemic strokes and microbleeds, as well as leukoariosis. Smoking has been identified as a risk factor, and then intracranial hemorrhage. So up to 60, maybe even 70 percent of patients who present with low bar intracranial hemorrhage, if you do um, MRIs on them and include gradient echo and or susceptibility weighted images, there is a really high prevalence of cerebral amyloid angi or uh, cerebral microbleeds. <clears throat> 
And then cerebral amyloid angiopathy, of course, is associated with microbleeds. But also Alzheimer's patients will have this finding as well. And there was a study looking at just going into a memory clinic, not necessarily patients who had Alzheimer's, but patients with some sort of memory complaint, how many of them have microbleeds, and 17% of um, them did. And then hypertension, catacil, and ApoE4 um, uh, allele status is also associated with um, cerebral microbleeds. And in terms of the uh, ApoE4 allele, um, it seems to be more associated with lobar bleeds rather than deep. And then in studies where they've looked at patients who are on antithrombotic therapy, patients who are taking aspirin or anticoagulants also have a higher incidence of microbleeds. So this is the Rotterdam study, which is a prospective um, population-based study of the elderly. And there was a subgroup analysis, which included MRI studies. And so they looked at the cerebral microbleed uh, incidence as well as the ApoE status. And what they found was that a large proportion of the elderly population, here are the age ranges here, actually did have cerebral microbleeds. In fact, uh, multiple cerebral microbleeds were seen um, in up to 23% in the age range, of, age range of 80 to 97 years old. So the incidence of cerebral microbleeds does increase with age. And what they found, too, was that the ApoE4 allele was associated with low bar microbleeds. So now I'm going to shift gears and talk briefly about cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which has a um, strong relationship with cerebral microbleeds. So cerebral amyloid angiopathy is amyloid beta peptide um, de deposition in small and medium-sized arteries and capillaries in the brain and leptomeninges, and is not related to systemic amyloidosis or secondary systemic amyloidosis. This process only occurs in the brain. And clinically, patients can have a um, wide range of presentation, or it can be found um, in asymptomatic patients when we scan their brain with MR imaging. But these patients can have hemorrhages, which are symptomatic, and or microhemorrhages. They may have superficial siderosis, Alzheimer's disease, recurrent ICH, transient neurological symptoms, something called inflammatory leukoencephalopathy. Well, which I'll touch on later, or they may be asymptomatic. And there is a relationship between the um, amyloid beta plaques that you see in cerebral amyloid angiopathy and Alzheimer's disease. So the plaque is an amino acid fragment of the amyloid uh, precursor protein called APP. And the majority of patients who have Alzheimer's disease will actually have some evidence of cerebral amyloid angiopathy seen on um, brain biopsy or post-mortem studies. But only a minority of patients with cerebral amyloid angiopathy who um, present with hemorrhage will actually have <coughs> Alzheimer's disease clinically. And so this um, graph to the right is taken from um, an article in 2012 so um, there is a difference in the amyloid beta plaques between patients with Alzheimer's disease and patients with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. They um, are both amyloid, they're both associated with um, amyloid beta plaques, but the plaques are deposited in the brain parenchyma. They're called senile plaques in Alzheimer's disease, whereas they're associated with, um, in cerebral amyloid angiopathy, the plaques are deposited in the um, cerebral blood vessels. And in Alzheimer's disease, the um, parenchymal plaques are 42 to uh, 43 amino acid fragments long, whereas in cerebral amyloid angiopathy, they're 39 to 40 um, amino acid fragments. There are mutations that have been identified with the amyloid beta fragments associated with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. They've been reported in Dutch, Iowa, Italian, Arctic, Japanese, and Flemish populations. And then we also know that ApoE subtypes 
um, are associated with a higher risk of amyloid angiopathy. So the APOE epsilon 2 and 4 alleles um, are associated with a higher risk of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And we also know that for patients who take um, antithrombotic therapy, have high blood pressure or head trauma, there's an increased risk of hemorrhage in patients who have that epsilon 2 allele. And this is just a diagram of the amyloid precursor protein. And here's the amyloid beta plaque. And these are uh, mutations that have been identified that are associated with cerebral amyloid angiopathy that have a cerebral autos autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. So we don't know for sure exactly what happens with cerebral amyloid angiopathy, but there are mutations to the, um, the APP fragments, and these are deposited within the walls of the blood vessels. And there may be a decrease in proteolysis of the amyloid beta peptide. Um, there may be problems with clearance of the amyloid beta peptide. So normally these, the peptides are absorbed through the blood and there's degradation in the brain parenchyma, and then there's peri um, perivascular lymphatic drainage of these peptides. But in cerebral amyloid angiopathy, there's a problem probably with this drainage, and the um, plaques are deposited within the wall. And then the artery walls are stiff and weakened and lead to leakage of blood products. So these are the Boston criteria for cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And um, if you, um, we'll start down here. So if a patient does have a single lobar cortical or subcortical hemorrhage, they're over the age of 55 and there's no other cause for hemorrhage, those patients may have possible cerebral amyloid angiopathy. If patients have had multiple uh, hemorrhages restricted to lobar cortical or subcortical regions and cerebellar hemorrhages are allowed. They're over the age of 55 and there's no other cause for hemorrhage. These patients have probable cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And then if patients have a lobar cortical or subcortical hemorrhage and the neuropathologist sees cerebral amyloid angiopathy on the specimen, then and there's no other cause for that patient to have a hemorrhage, then those patients um, have probable cerebral amyloid angiopathy with supporting pathology. So whenever our patients come in with a um, intracranial hemorrhage with, um, and they require hematoma evacuation, it is very helpful from a stroke standpoint to actually send the specimen off to the pathologist so that they can test for amyloid because it does help us with um, making treatment decisions down the road if they need antiplatelet or antithrombotic therapy. And then definite cerebral amyloid angiopathy would be diagnosed based on a postmortem examination showing severe cerebral amyloid angiopathy with vasculopathy. Now, I think if the neuropathologist was here, is anyone here from neuropathology? No. <laughs> I've had this conversation um, with them before, and when they do do specimens and tests for amyloid, there is a certain level of amyloid seen in the normal aging population. So really, it is up to the um, clinical um, discretion of the um, clinician taking care of that patient, whether or not clinically that patient has cerebral amyloid angiopathy, because they will see it in the normal aging population. Mm-hmm. It's nice to get um, lepto um, meningeal tissue and some cortical tissue. Yeah. I don't know if they actually will see it in the hematoma itself. And I don't know, maybe you can comment how often you guys don't. Would there be any reason not to send a specimen to the pathologist? I had did, I ran into it once, but I feel like usually you guys do send the specimen to the uh, pathology lab. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's a, I think it's an important point. Um, I always try to be um, forward thinking when patients go for a craniotomy or brain biopsy. It is nice to think, okay, what, wh how could this tissue be valuable to us in the future? And with, we know with patients aging that the incidence of atrial fibrillation, for example, just increases tremendously with age. So by the time patients are in their 80s, about 10 or 12 percent of patients will have atrial fibrillation. And if they have had a symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage and they have cerebral amyloid angiopathy findings on their biopsy, certainly that's going to um, persuade our decision making. Um, so I would, I personally think that it's very helpful to have that information if they have a symptomatic, non-traumatic ICH. And there are other clinical uh, manifestations of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. There is um, something called cerebral amyloid angiopathy related inflammation, which I have actually never seen, um, but it's well described in the literature. And patients, rather than presenting with a hemorrhage, patients will present with an acute or subacute neurological symptoms with encephalopathy, seizures, and headache. And their MRI shows a leukoencephalopathy with patchy and confluent areas of hyperintensity on flare and T2 images and microbleeds on the gradient echo images. And the CSF can show pleocytosis and mildly elevated protein. And these patients can respond to immunosuppression. So these um, scans may look like PRESS, basically, which is posterior reversible leukoencephalopathy syndrome. And actually, um, throughout the years, there have been immunotherapy trials for Alzheimer's disease, which targeted amyloid beta peptide. And um, some of these patients actually develop vasogenic edema and cortical microhemorrhages from the treatment. And I remember when I was a resident at Rush, we actually had a really big Alzheimer's program. And so we were part of one of these studies, and we had a patient come in with a press-like um, clinical syndrome and she was actually on one of these monoclonal antibodies for um, amyloid um, peptide. And so um, their clinical syndrome basically mimicked this inflammatory amyloid beta-related um, angiitis. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about what is the clinical relevance of the cerebral microbleeds and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So again, um, back to the um, Rotterdam study, which was a prospective um, population-based study of the aging, um, there was this subgroup analysis that looked at the president, presence of microbleeds in the aging. And what they found were that deep and infratutorial uh, microbleeds, which are associated with hypertension uh, classically, were associated with an increase in mortality as well as greater than or equal to five microbleeds. So on the left is a graph showing you um, these patients had zero microbleeds, these patients had one, these patients had two to four, and these patients had um, five, uh, five or more. And the survival rate decreased with the number of microbleeds, and the follow-up was um, five years or more. And interestingly, strictly low bar bleeds were not associated with an increase in mortality. There have also been a few studies looking at the, if you find cerebral microbleeds in patients who are presenting with stroke, what is their risk of having another stroke down the road? And cerebral microbleeds have been shown to be a predictor for recurrent ischemic and or hemorrhagic stroke. So this is a meta-analysis of studies looking at the um, incidence of cerebral microbleeds and the rate of recurrent stroke. And certainly there was a trend towards cerebral microbleeds um, being associated with an increased risk of um, intracranial hemorrhage as well as a risk of um, ischemic stroke. In um, low bar intracranial hemorrhage patients, so our patients who um, present to the hospital with a symptomatic hemorrhage, 
the um, higher the number of the microbleeds at the time of the intracranial hemorrhage, the more likely they are to have recurrent symptomatic uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And the recurrent risk of having an ICH in patients with one, two, three, or over six uh, microhemorrhages on their baseline MRI was 14, 17, 38, and 51 percent. So patients who had greater than or equal to six microhemorrhages had about a 51 percent chance of having a recurrent symptomatic ICH, which is huge. And one of the, um, I think, biggest conundrums for us as neurologists is what do we do with these patients when we find this information? Because it's actually, it can be really stressful because for us, we're trying to weigh the risks of, we don't want our patient to have another hemorrhage, or if they've never had a hemorrhage, we don't want them to have one ever. And, um, but if they have something like atrial fibrillation or congestive heart failure, how do we weigh the risk, uh, or even um, if they've had a myocardial infarction, how do we weigh the risk of trying to prevent an ischemic vascular event with a recurrent or a primary ICH? And that's one of the biggest dilemmas that we're faced with. And there have been studies looking at the risk of antiplatelet therapy in survivors of ICH and patients who um, have microbleeds and take antiplatelet therapy. There's really no, there are definitely no randomized control trials looking at patients who have ICH, putting them on antithrombotic therapy versus not, and then um, following them for years. There have been studies, though, again, looking at survivors of intracranial hemorrhage and patients who then go on to have, um, who then go on to take antiplatelet therapy. And there is one study that looked at survivals of ICH patients who needed antithrombotic therapy because they had a vascular indication for it. The most common indication was a history of ischemic heart disease. And um, in one study published, 22% of the patients um, were taking antiplatelet therapy. And they followed these patients. And patients who took aspirin versus patients did not, who did not, there was no difference in the risk of recurrent ICH. Overall, though, there is actually data that is conflicting, and there, is some, there are some case series that have shown that there may be an increased risk of ICH, and others have not shown this. And one of the biggest dilemmas that we face is starting anticoagulant therapy. Um, we do know that patients who present with symptomatic ICH, about 60, maybe even 70% of them will have cerebral microbleeds on their MR imaging. And if they have microbleeds on their MR imaging, we know that they're much more likely to have another symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage down the road. But if we place them on oral anticoagulation, are they more likely to have a symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage? You would assume so. Um, there have been retrospective reviews of patients with non-traumatic warfare and associated ICH versus patients who are taking warfarin who had no history of ICH but had an MRI completed. And patients who have an ICH and um, were on warfarin were much more likely to have um, cerebral microbleeds on their MR imaging comparing patients who take warfarin but have no history of symptomatic ICH. Now, we don't know if the, um, if the ICH, of course, was caused by the warfarin, but that's, of course, the concern. So this is another study looking at the risk of anticoagulant therapy in patients with cerebral microbleeds. And um, here you can tell that in intracranial um, hemorrhage cases, the presence of microbleeds was significantly higher um, in patients with intracranial hemorrhage versus the controls. And here's a um, meta-analysis looking at cerebral microbleeds and antithrombotic use and um, following these patients prospectively. The largest series is, um, was published by Sue in um, 2008. 
there were 908 patients included, most of them were on antiplatelet therapy, so 92%, and a minority were on warfarin um, therapy. And basically, if patients had microbleeds on their MR imaging versus patients who didn't have microbleeds, there was a much higher risk of having a symptomatic um, intracranial hemorrhage during follow-up. So again, we know that deep and infratatorial um, microbleeds greater than, micro, greater than five um, or equal to five microbleeds are associated with an increase in mortality. And, and patients who have ischemic stroke, the, ins, the presence of microbleeds is associated with a higher risk of ischemic stroke and or hemorrhagic strokes. And in patients with low bar intracranial hemorrhage, the presence of cerebral microbleeds um, is associated with a higher risk of recurrent symptomatic ICH, and the risk increases with a higher number of cerebral microbleeds. Patients taking warfarin who have an ICH are much more likely to have cerebral microbleeds than, warf than um, patients without an ICH. But again, there are no randomized controlled trials looking at risk of oral anticoagulation use in patients with cerebral microbleeds. And really, there's limited prospective trials. So what's on the horizon, which I think um, will be very helpful, is there's a CROMIS-2 trial, which is ongoing right now in UK. They're actively enrolling. And this is a trial um, looking at the presence of microbleeds to help predict the risk of symptomatic oral anticoagulation-associated ICH in patients who are um, anticoagulated um, following cardioembolic stroke due to AFib. And the burden and distribution of microbleeds at baseline will be evaluated. And then another study that's ongoing is um, called the um, cerebral microbleed during um, NOAC. NOAC stands for novel oral anticoagulation or warfarin therapy in patients with Nonvalvular AFib with acute ischemic stroke. And this study um, is basically looking at patients who are placed on NOACs and following their cerebral um, microbleed um, presence. And um, the primary endpoint is the proportion of patients with an increased number of cerebral microbleeds 12, after 12 months of treatment of um, NOAC therapy. And then there have been some case series regarding the risk of thrombolysis patients. The risk of um, uh, th uh, hemorrhage in thrombolysis patients who have cerebral microbleeds. So when we give patients IV TPA when they present with an acute ischemic stroke, we make that decision based on a head CT. Most of our patients do not have MRI data that's available. Once in a while they do. Um, the patient that I started out with, if you recall, that patient had had an MRI within the past year. Um, but there's no really good data on patients with um, uh, cerebral microbleeds and the use of IV thrombolytics. There are just case series. And there are two case series that actually show that um, the risk of ICH was not higher in patients who had cerebral microbleeds versus patients without, but the sample size was very small um, because, again, most patients didn't have an MRI before they actually got the thrombolysis. And theoretically, if you received thrombolysis and you had microbleeds after the thrombolysis, we don't know if they were there before you received the thrombolysis. So in the diffuse trial, there was a subgroup analysis these patients actually did have an MRI before they received IV thrombolysis. And these patients received IV TPA in the three to six hour um, last known normal window. And they compared the risk of ICH between patients with cerebral microbleeds and patients who didn't have cerebral microbleeds. And again, the risk was not any higher between the two groups. And then there was another retrospective review of patients who did happen to have a pretreatment MRI before they received um, IV TPA, and um, 
in this retrospective review, they found that 18% of their patients who had been given IV TPA actually did have evidence of microbleeds on their MRI. And um, there was no difference in the um, rate of hemorrhage between the patients who had microbleeds versus those who did not. So again, the initial case I showed you, that patient did have um, multiple cerebral am um, microbleeds and presumably cerebral amyloid angiopathy. We've actually had several cases of patients where we've scanned them later um, after um, they've received IV TPA, and we've found that they have multiple cerebral microbleeds, and some of them have bled and some of them have not. So how do we make tr treatment decisions regarding antithrombotic therapy in patients with cerebral microbleeds? Well, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that um, nowadays um, there's more, there are more options than just warfarin for patients with non-valvular um, AFib. And the newer um, anticoagulants, including dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, they're actually, um, they actually have a lower risk of intracranial hemorrhage compared to warfarin. And so now there's actually an interest in should we maybe be putting patients who have a previous history, maybe they have um, a few microbleeds and locations associated with hypertensive vasculopathy, and um, if we control their blood pressure well, could we actually put these patients on a um, uh, NOACs, the newer ones are called NOACs. Could we put these patients on NOACs rather than warfarin and just make sure that their blood pressure is tightly controlled? Or in patients who actually have microbleeds but have never had a symptomatic hemorrhage, should we be using NOACs in those patients, especially if their risk for having an ischemic stroke, which we determine by using what's called a um, a risk stratification score, the most widely used one is the CHADS-2 score for AFib patients. Um, if patients have never had a hemorrhage but they have a high risk of having an embolic event, those patients you um, may want to consider using a NOAC in. And so these, this is actually, I would say, kind of a hot topic right now in the stroke world, and the answer is we don't really know. <laughs> um, but hopefully we will know um, in the future. Um, so the two, two of the gurus in stroke neurology that have a huge interest in cerebral microbleeds are Steven Greenberg at uh, Mass General and then um, Dr. Mark Fisher. And um, this is actually a publication by um, Dr. Mark Fisher that was um, published in Frontiers of Neurology. But this is something that he proposed and presented at our um, last International Stroke Conference. And it's actually just an algorithm based on expert opinion of how to approach a patient with um, uh, atrial fibrillation who you think may need anticoagulation. And I wanted to point out that these this algorithm is not based on patients who have had a symptomatic hemorrhage, but it's patients who are at high risk of having a stroke um, because they have atrial fibrillation and their CHADS-2 score is um, high. So um, in this algorithm, he advocates actually screening patients with MRI if they haven't had an MRI in the past, if they're over um, or equal to age 60. So if they're not 60, then he wouldn't screen them. If they are over the age 60, then he recommends an MRI um, screening before they receive anticoagulation. And if there are no microbleeds um, present, the patient should be anticoagulated if it's deemed appropriate, and um, really any anticoagulation could be used. If the patient has um, uh, some um, microbleeds seen on the MRI, then um, you need to determine if they're cortical or subcortical microbleeds. If they have less than five so subcortical microbleeds, then you can anticoagulate as usual. But if they have cortical microbleeds, and those are the ones that we worry about, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, um, or if they have greater than or equal to five so subcortical microbleeds, those patients should have a um, neurology consultation and um, if anticoagulation is used, then um, warfarin should be avoided and newer anticoagulants um, could be considered. 
And um, he actually advocates for then repeating the MRI and seeing if there's a uh, microbleed pr progression, and if there is, discontinuing the anticoagulation. Um, so I actually reached out to Dr. Greenberg at Mass General and asked him his opinion, is he using these NOACs more? Because it's actually a really um, a relevant topic for our stroke clinic. And um, he, is, he indicated that he's starting to use them more as well. Again, these are not in patients who present with symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage, but patients who we incidentally find um, some microbleeds on. And if you notice, um, superficial siderosis is not on this slide, and those patients have um, much more substantial bleeding around the meninges of the brain. And, Certainly, from my standpoint, I would not put those patients on anticoagulation. And one of the things I just wanted to point out is that in the past, there have been studies that sh have shown warfare and has been shown to increase the risk of hemorrhage seven to tenfold in patients with cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So I think most of the neurologists would agree in this room if a patient has cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and certainly if they've had a symptomatic hemorrhage and we've found it on brain biopsy, then those patients we would not anticoagulate. And there are actually other alternatives for those patients. Um, so the Watchman device was actually recently FDA approved um, to use in patients with AFib who, not, who cannot take oral anticoagulation. The only problem with it is that patients have to be anticoagulated for about six weeks um, around the time the um, device is um, placed until it's endothelialized. And so if you have a patient that's had a symptomatic hemorrhage, it can be um, uh, a little daunting to consider putting them on anticoagulation for six weeks. Um, the other options are non-FDA approved devices. So there's a Lariat um, left atrial appendage um, suture device and the atria um, clip device. And um, the with the, um, um, I believe it's a Lariat device, they can actually put the device in without doing open heart surgery. So they can put it in going through the chest wall. And that's it. Thank <laughs> you.